Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Business Growth on Purpose. I'm your host, Jose Palomino, CEO of Value Prop Interactive. And today, I just want to talk a little bit about the number one objective of any growth or profit-making strategy. So if you're a B2B company and you're looking out at the market, and maybe you're in a market right now, like manufacturing or other industrial services where things are good right now, orders are coming in. There's been this backlog uh, because of supply chain pressure. So you're actually getting orders in and, and, and you're even a little amazed and you're saying, wow, this is really coming in pretty strong. So the question is why worry about it? Why do anything? So this is the first of three episodes where I want to cover this idea of what to do when things are going well. And here's the first thing. And this would be true whether things are going well or things are challenging. doesn't matter. Either way, it, it applies. And that is, do you understand your best customer's biggest problem? Do you understand your best customer's biggest problem? Now, now by that, I don't mean that uh, you necessarily can solve that biggest problem, although your success could be tied to how well you align what you offer to that biggest problem. But it really goes to the heart of the matter is, do you really understand what's going on in your best customer's world? And even preceding that thought, of course, is do you know who your best customer is? Have you made that decision? Have you looked at that issue? And I've often talked about your target market. And, and again, most of the literature on target marketing and just about any expert who speaks on this will tell you about niching down and all of that's certainly true. Uh, but they often talk about it in terms of things that could be found if you were looking at a database of potential prospects, people that you wanna reach out to as leads. So you tend to think about it by industry or by geography or something. And I want to challenge you to broaden that just a little bit. So it's kind of broaden to refine it, broaden it to refine it, which is simply uh, like who is your best customer and why? And it may be that the commonalities that make a best customer, best customer for you is not an industry identification. It could be a particular kind of buyer at a certain level. You do very well with people involved, let's say in product launches. So product management, product marketing people regardless of industry. That'd be one example. In manufacturing, uh, it's not going to be procurement. You may That may be the predominant title you end up dealing with, but that's not a growth strategy. Procurement is not going to lead to growth. Procurement is only going to lead to you having to squeeze your margins further. Now, I'm not saying you don't have to deal with procurement. If you sell to a big company, you're going to have to deal with procurement. It's an inevitable part of it. And it serves its purpose. And in a big enough organization, a good procurement relationship could lead you to streamlining uh, contracts, understanding their requirements, uh, having uh, being on their short list, so you always get invited to bid. But again, those are not things that lead to margin growth as much as they deal to cost reduction on the part of your big buyer, which is why they want to put you in that situation. And, and some of that is just unavoidable. But I'm thinking a little bit broader in terms of the kind of problems you solve, because then what ends up happening is somebody sees you as the solution to a big problem. Uh, they're looking to bring a new product online and you make a critical part for it. Your ability to engineer, problem solve, uh, respond in a timely fashion, all those things for that best customer, if in fact you have determined that's your best customer, uh, could be worth a lot more than the fact that you might uh, not be the absolute lowest cost provider of that part, but you are actually the, the, the provider that can get them to market faster. What is that worth to them? If they're looking to launch a product that they're going to sell, you know, a, a thousand units and make uh, $10,000 per unit, that's a lot of thousands. That's a, what is it, $10 million. Uh, so you actually could be a solution to a $10 million problem. So really start thinking about it in terms of their problems, their challenges, what are they facing? Uh, if they're, for example, concerned about um, supply chain issues from the point of view of a critical material that they use in their production, or they're considering to use in their production, and your services helps them reduce the number of uh, the amount of material that they need to use to make the part, 
you have a more efficient way of making something. That could actually be a real critical solution to their problem. It has nothing to do with the part itself per se, but it's the way you approach things. In some cases, uh, buyers, especially in complex categories, really want to work with somebody who has good project management, who has a really a detailed responsiveness to what they're working on and can give them answers right away. Now, those are things you can actually decide to do. Th those aren't things that require huge technology investments or frankly, even any really big investments at all. Those are what I call force of will decisions, things that you could just say, we're going to do that and do it. And there are ways to do that, whether it's just tracking things on spreadsheets better, using something like Google Docs so everybody can see your spreadsheet at the same time. Microsoft obviously can do the same thing uh, these days. But it's thinking about how do I align to the biggest problem my customer's facing? So first, identify your best customer. And I said biggest before. I didn't mean biggest per se in terms of uh, just the volume. Your, your biggest volume buyer may not be your best customer may be very important to you, may keep you busy, may give you a lot of work, but if you've been working with them for a long time and they are actually a big company, chances are they've been squeezing you on margin for some time now. And on a per unit basis, and maybe even on an aggregate basis, it may not be that great a piece of business. I've worked with clients that they, after doing this kind of an analysis, they realized that although it represented 40% of their business, this big company actually only contributed about 10% of the EBITDA, which is a huge consumer of resource for a very little return. As I like to say, the juice was not worth the squeeze. And so they repriced a lot of their uh, products and they lost about half of that business because they repriced it out of the realm that that customer wanted to pay. But the pieces they kept, they kept much more profitably. It actually contributed to an EBITDA increase and they had a more sane operation. They were actually be, it were able to be more responsive to other better paying customers. So really think about who your best customer is. Think about it in terms of, um, it could be as esoteric as their payment terms. If you have a customer that always wants to pay in 120 days, unless you are a bank, that's a lot of money to be out on the street and waiting for. And I know in some industries you may be listening and saying, well, you don't know our industry, everybody's, at 90 days, 120 days, it's just what it is. And that may be true, but there might be ways to incentivize people to squeeze that sum. And again, you don't have to go from 120 days to instant payment, but from 120 to 90 is a significant piece of progress on cash flow if you can do it. So think about which customers do that. Think about those that really value or respect what you do. In other words, you don't feel like a totally interchangeable cog but in fact, you actually believe, you feel that you can actually um, continue building a relationship with them because they think what you do and the way you do it is important, it's valuable. Think in terms also of those that actually give you the work you want to do. I know that sounds weird. You're in business to be in business and you do the work that you're given, but I'm sure they're projects you and your team prefer. So... I interviewed a, uh, a business owner at one point that said, look, we, we realized that we really liked the really sm smaller scale projects, less number of units, but they were more complex and at, at, at higher tolerances. And so we got, started going after that business and started really being responsive for that business. It turned out a lot of our competitors didn't like that business, but the customers we found were mostly in aerospace related industries or subcontractors who really needed that level of precision and a partner who can work with that level of number of parts and so on in a smaller run. So instead of trying to get the 10,000 unit sale, we were very happy with the 50 unit sale that was complex and we could charge accordingly. So think about that. Think about what you want to do. Think about what you're good at doing. Think about the, the relationships that are strong and start identifying that. And this could be as simple as listing on a whiteboard your top 20, 30, 40 relationships that come to mind, talking to your team over a pizza and saying, okay, what do we like about them? And creating columns of how about payment? How about uh, the uh, ability to work directly with their technical staff? We're not, we're not always having to go through a filter. Um, the ability to handle exceptions that, so that if something comes up that's 
that uh, doesn't make sense to us. We can ask questions without losing points in their eyes. Um, things like that, or not after dealing with them for five years, you don't have to always be competing on a three bid for every next piece of work. In some cases, you do get sole source bid because they value what you do. And they'll put you out to bid on some parts every now and then to just keep you honest, but you can live with that. So whatever those criteria are, and there's no universal criteria, this is something you have to decide for your business. Once you've identified that category of company, you say, oh, that's in this industry, in this geography, this size company, this type of part of their value chain process is where we really do well. Then start asking this question, what's their biggest problem? And in fact, ask them, talk to them. Next time you talk to them and say, listen, you know, just trying to suss out, get a better sense of what's going on in your industry and in, let's say medical devices for mid-sized medical device companies. Uh, with all the money flowing into COVID-related things, how has that left you? And you might say, oh boy, it's really put a, a real crimp on us. We've get, we're getting less uh, educational funding for the stuff we're doing, less R&D or whatever. And I'm making that up. I have no idea what that is, but depending on who your customer is. And, and two things happen by doing this. One, your customer and your customer contact will see you differently. See, because up till now, maybe all you're talking about is the part, the thing you do for them, the service you provide for them, uh, always digging in on just the doing of the doing. And you're never really asking them. And, and this goes way beyond, hey, how are your kids? And, and uh, how's your daughter doing in ballet? It's not that kind of a question. It's really the stuff. And, and by the way, that's all nice. And connecting as a human being, I think is always a good idea if you can, if you can do it sincerely and, and, it, and it doesn't feel... Uh, like you're following the script, but I'm talking about going beyond that to really understand their business and say, look, the reason I'm asking is because there's some things we might be able to do, don't know, but maybe in how we work with you that could help you with your problem if we understood it. And, and maybe you don't want to call it a problem, your biggest challenges or what are your main goals for the next year? Those are all things that will reveal to you what's mattering to them. So why not do that for every customer? Why isn't that just normal sales 101? And to some degree, it should be. But this is something you can actually do once you zero in on who you want to do business with most. And it's actually stuff you can look up. I mean, there's tons of information out there. If you, if you just said industry forecast four and you put in the industry of who you think might be the source of your best customers, and uh, you'll see all kinds of reports. The, the big consulting firms, the Deloitte, the PwC, they publish this stuff all the time. And yes, it tends to have a big company cast, but that may be your customer. Maybe you may not be a, 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 a multinational, but maybe your customer is. And, and these are things that gives you perspective. It doesn't mean you have to show up like all of a sudden you're their management consultant helping them figure out their strategy for the future. It's not that at all. It's about alignment. So the first thing is you try to figure out who is your best customer? Who's the customer you most want to align with? And one of the best ways to align with the customer is, is to let them know you're actually interested in what's happening in their world. And you're interested in seeing if you can be a help in any way. And you're interested in seeing if what you do can help them. See, because once you align with their big objectives, their big challenges, their big problems, you're no longer just a vendor or just a supplier you're now entering the world of being a partner and partners get margins because you're value add you're adding more than just the raw cost of material plus some sort of uh, assumption of uh, labor uh, additive uh, process and what they think you should get paid instead you start moving into the world where you are strategic you're important to them and companies and people at companies will invest in things they think are important. So this is one way to become important. So even if right now you have a lot of orders coming in, more orders than you've seen in the last three years, maybe you were already starting to grow before the pandemic and things hit a little bit of a speed bump and now they're really accelerating and you're like amazed, you're growing 30% year over year. As I always say, when I, when I hit this topic, I say, by all means, uh, cash the checks, be happy for the boom, but like all booms, uh, they tend to have a, uh, a you know a, an expiration date on them. 
they're not going to last forever. And the world, as we now know, just looking all around us, uh, in the pandemic, immediately coming out of it, energy shocks, war, that's never not going to be true. There's always those changes. So you have to think strategically to protect your business and leverage this moment now more than ever to start thinking about how do we take this to the next level? So if you have orders coming and you're thinking, well, I don't, I don't have time to think about strategic planning. I don't have time to think about uh, marketing and, and growing. We don't even need more sales. We have more than we can handle. God bless you. That's, that's awesome right now. But what if you could start in the midst of that abundance, start paring down or purifying your book of business to higher margin business? It's a perfect time to do that. It's hard to do if you're sucking wind looking for orders. It's not that hard to do if you have more orders than you can possibly handle. So which ones do you really want to handle? Which, which customers do you want to prioritize to the front of the line? You say, well, all of them, because we treat all our customers the same. And that's a nice virtuous thought. As a practical reality, that's actually not true. Uh, nobody does. We, 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 we aspire to and we should live to our values. You should have values that you live to no matter who the customer is, however small. But where you're going to focus extra attention, executive time, reaching out to customers, having conversations with customers, all of that is a is a matter of prioritization. It can't just be who happens to be on the phone. It has to be something you do on purpose. So that's uh, it for today. We'll continue on this theme of what to do in these exciting and maybe abundant times, but how to leverage the abundance to leave you with more lasting value. Leveraging the abundance to leave you with more lasting value. So this is Jose Palomino again with Business Growth on Purpose. Until next time, to your success. Thanks for listening to another episode of Business Growth on Purpose. If you like the show, hit subscribe and leave us a review to help other people find the podcast. And if you're ready to take the next step in driving intentional growth for your business, come check out what we're doing at valueprop.com. We've developed industry-leading programs and systems to help B2B owners take control of their growth. Until then, thanks for listening to another episode of Business Growth on Purpose.